like you know what we've been working on and thinking about and what has happened uh, when it comes to auditing and more specifically detecting uh, the use of copyright protected content by uh, by NLMs. Um, and this is very much a tutorial, right? It's not, you know, there are no answers. There are no perfect solutions. Uh, the feed is moving extremely fast. Um, you know, everything has happened in the past year or so uh, in this uh, in this field mostly uh, and and we're still trying to figure out like what works what doesn't what is a good solution uh, what are some of the pitfalls uh, and this is basically kind of a you know food for thought uh, talk rather than you know this is the conclusion and or solution um, so the first one you know you've you've heard you know, you had a keynote, you've had a keynote last uh, yesterday on the topic. So I won't spend too much time on this, but basically LLMs are everywhere and companies developing them uh, are, you know, everywhere. Um, however, and, and one thing that, that again, I think is, is worth emphasizing is fundamentally, I do think that like a lot of other machine learning applications, the intelligence, the you know, the emerging properties, whatever way you want to call them, fundamentally come from extremely large amounts of training data. Um, you know, GPA three, the first one was trained on three hundred uh, billion tokens, and then the latest one have seen like you know more than a, a trillion uh, tokens um, coming from. All kind of places from you know as you can see in the infographics on on the right you know patent uh, application Wikipedia uh, but also a lot of academic publishing uh, you know plus newspapers New York Times Guardian Washington Post Coursera etc. Et um, and fundamentally, if we want to understand. LLMs, what they are good at, what they are not good at, where some of the functionalities are coming from, where some of the biases are coming from, and, and fundamentally also what is what is fair with respect to uh, the development, the use, and the commercialization ultimately of those of those LLMs, we need to better understand the data they've been trained on, and and that includes, as you've seen, you know. Uh, copyrighted content, a lot of lawsuits uh, from, you know, the Game of Thrones author to the New York Times to uh, book publishing to, you know, regurgitation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as well as harmful content and other, you know, undesirable uh, behavior. And so this talk is really about how can we audit uh, LLM's pre-training datasets. And, and mostly, I think I'll try to cover and discuss pro and cons and our current thinking with respect to three different approaches that have been uh, considered uh, to audit uh, LLM's pre-training uh, data. Um, the first one is basically, and, and kind of the first one that came out, are basically data provenance too, right? So these data sets are, are gigantic. They're very hard to uh, process and, and search. But we've seen, uh, you know, last year basically, uh, you know, quite a range of really good tools that basically allow you to efficiently search those data sets, at least the public ones. Um, you know, uh, the Allen Institute developed a tool called What's in My uh, Big Data. Uh, the MIT Media Lab developed the Data Provenance uh, Explorer. And those tools basically allow you to search by, by domain, by keywords, et cetera, et cetera to get a sense of what's in those, uh, those data sets. So you can go and search for the New York Times and at least everything that has been directly scraped from the New York Times website uh, will be shown allowing you to build an understanding of you know, at least the, you know, the main sources of data for, uh, for the lens. Um, and this is you know, quite, a fantastic, quite a fantastic tool, um, but unfortunately, I think companies are you know, increasingly not transparent about what data set they use, um, including most of them starting to you know, scrape their own content and increasingly closing up uh, what was publicly available 
in terms of information about the data set they used to train the models. And this was clear when, you know, Meta, for example, stopped disclosing the data uh, they used to train their Lama model. Uh, when OpenAI released their new uh, proprietary web crawler, or when, you know, Mistral's uh, CEO basically said that, you know, they can't really share data about, they can reshare really information about their training data uh, because it is, you know, it's a secret sauce. It's a highly competitive and they see what data they put inside their model to be uh, a competitive advantage. So really good, really strong tools, unfortunately likely to be less and less um, useful when it comes to uh, the largest uh, commercial models. But I think that the second one, uh, and probably it's not gonna come to us as a surprise to many of you in the room, is is okay, given that you know it's not going to be publicly available. Uh, is there a way, basically, for us to audit uh, the trained model instead? Right. So you have a data set. The large language model is is trained on this data set, and then the large language model is released. You know, in a number of forms. You know, like from white box to black box to you know black box with some some constraint. Um, and 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 you have content, and and fundamentally the question is, can you make can you infer can you make a good guess of whether a piece of content was seen during training by a large language model? And while this is a new question, it's obviously you know not a new task, right? This is something that is well studied in in privacy. Uh, called membership inference attack. Uh, actually, the, the very first one came from a very long time ago, uh, 2008, basically, to, to try to detect the, the contribution of a, a target individual in aggregate DNA information, uh, which, to the best of my knowledge, is the first kind of MIA out there. And since then, they've been extensively used to test uh, the privacy preserving capabilities and or information leakages of a range of systems ranging from you know aggregate data to machine learning models to synthetic data sets and often using something called shadow models. Um, interestingly, this transfer privacy was also designed to protect against MIAs even by omniscient attackers. So we have a problem that exists in the privacy literature uh, that is very relevant to today's LLM. The issue is the way we've been doing things in privacy, this shadow modeling technique, uh, basically relies on constructing shadow data sets and then training a very large number of shadow models with and without the target record, which is obviously something that is not doable when it comes to LLM. So this is a really good setup and it works very, very well. And there's some efficient even ways to do this so that you don't have to train from scratch models, et cetera, et cetera. But, but fundamentally, none of this, like even just training another LLM for the purpose of the attack is, is not doable. Uh, so what do we do? So maybe that's a quick recap. I'm not going to spend too much time, but basically, we, you know, kind of primer on, on the LMs, you know, language is divided into token, it can be a word, it can be part of a word, it can be multiple words. Um, you know, the foundation state of the art models are trained for next token prediction, uh, basically minimizing the cost entropy loss. And then at inference time, basically given a, a context a set of token, uh, the LLM will predict uh, the probability distribution over all tokens in the vocabulary for the next token, right? So basically given the context here, attention is not two, it's gonna predict, it's gonna look at all the possible words and basically uh, give you a probability. The question is, is how do we do now document level membership inference uh, when we cannot train shadow models? Um, and basically what we need to do is we need to rely on and learn solely from the output of one large language model that we have and, and possibly reference model, assuming that you have other models that you can potentially use to help you um, make a prediction. 
Uh, and fundamentally, the intuition is that, you know, something like this, right? Basically, if you've seen the book, right, and if you've seen 1984, for example, like, you know, given um, given a context, right? So in this case, war is peace, freedom is, uh, you know, it is more likely that the probability of, of slavery is going to be is going to be high than if you've not seen 1984 uh, during training. And then from there, basically methods are you know developed, calibrated, trained, and we're going to talk more about the existing methods on you know books, content, documents that are believed to be member and non-members. Right. So basically, you are trying to train, calibrate, develop your model by making informed guesses on what you think was definitely seen during training and what was likely to not be seen during training. And typically what you do, or typically what has been done is basically a model was you know, released at a certain uh, point in time. And you're gonna look, for example, at books that are posted on Project Gutenberg after the model was released or papers and archive that were posted after the model was released. And from this, you hope to start building an intuition of what should you look at to be able to make uh, an informed guess. Then basically there's a range of methods. So uh, I'll go over them in chronological order. Uh, so the first one actually is the one the one we developed. Um, basically what we did uh, is we trained a classifier on, on normalized probabilities. So basically we queried the LLM. Uh, literally we you know we we read the book. Um, and then, and then we try to retrieve what we think is relevant for uh, predicting membership. So basically, we normalize each probability by dividing by, you know, dividing it by basically or where we think intrinsically the token uh, should be. And then the intuition for us is that uh, an LLM would predict different probabilities for more rare token, depending on whether it has seen the text before or not. And then the prediction is basically, you know, like in shadow modeling, basically we use a simple uh, machine learning classifier uh, on all the normalized probabilities. Um, so this is this is basically how it works. It gives us it, it gives us you know something that's you know a priori pretty good, uh, and an AUC of eighty six uh, for books with a fairly high uh, true positive rate at low false positive rate. So that's the first method, and this was in, in October 2023. Um, two days later, another method came out uh, called MinK percentage prob that leverages a, a similar ID. And in this case, specifically, they look at the minimum predicted probability. So basically, same thing, they query the LLM for all predicted probability for each token. But what they do is they take the mean of the lowest probability. So their intuition is basically that it's a it's it's a case in which if the LLM were to not have seen a given piece of text, the mean of the lowest K probability would be significantly lower than if it had seen that piece of text. And so that truly their belief is that the signal is in the lowest probabilities. And the cases where, you know, if it had seen the text, you would expect the model to memorize it and to remember something and therefore to give it a, a higher probability. And then they use, while we use a classifier, they actually use a fairly simple uh, threshold uh, to decide on the prediction. And, and again, it works quite well, uh, reaching an, an AUC of 76 on uh, Wikipedia uh, data. This was uh, soon after. Uh, recently, again, fast moving field, uh, a week ago, basically a new method came out on, on archive uh, called MinK++. And basically the idea is uh, very similar to MinK, except that they believe that you have to fundamentally account for normalization. So similar idea to uh, what we have, but then basically they, they normalize it in, in a quite smart uh, fashion uh, by taking into account the log of the probability over the vocabulary, the vocabulary of the model. And this leads to a further improvement over a mean k um, of 
seven uh, percentage uh, percentage points. So all of this is is quite encouraging. Um, however, um, there are some you know again fast moving. Literally, last one was a week ago. Um, some some limitations of of something that fundamentally compared to you know for example what we do when it comes to uh, privacy leakages and shadow models uh, something that's intrinsically post hoc. Um, first, from a copyright perspective, um, it's basically it's really hard to definitely conclude that you know the high you see you know high TPF at low FPR. Uh, comes from the original material having been seen during pre-training, right? In a sense, in the copyright, from a copyright perspective, you know, if you take the, the war is peace, freedom is slavery, uh, it might very well have seen it somewhere else than in 1984, right? There's a lot of websites who are, like, you know, reusing this quote over and over again. Uh, if you look at Harry Potter, if you look at Game of Thrones, right, the fact that, you know, the model knows something about Game of Thrones might very well come from the internet, from Wikipedia, from fan fiction, and the model might actually have never seen the books during training. So that is like kind of a fundamental, like, you know, kind of limitation of these methods. And I think more important, I mean, not more important, but equally important, uh, is what, how do they work from, from a scientific perspective, right? And I think very interestingly, all the results so far, when you think about it, they basically come from a classifier um, that, that uses the model somehow to try to distinguish between members and non-members in a test set. And the issue with this is basically something that has been raised recently by actually some of the authors of Minke, uh, I think a month after publishing their first uh, their first paper, is is the risk of distribution shift. Is the risk of somehow some thing to be different between members and non-members between books posted on Project Gutenberg before and after the release of a model, between paper posted in archive before and after the release of a model. That that means that while your method lead you know results in a in a quite good AUC, it is it is unclear the extent to which this is due to what you hope to study, which is membership or non-membership, or anything else basically that distinguishes members from non-members. And and from a scientific perspective, right, this is this is a really fundamental question. Which is to which extent is this is all correlation and this is all postdoc. To which extent can you be convinced that what you observe is actually what you think you're observing, which is does it predict membership versus does it predict does it catch something else that distinguishes members and non members? And this is something actually that even in you know in our first paper we try to, to control for, you know, you know, arguably quite crude. Uh, crude attempt at controlling, for example, by looking at the publication date of a book, right? And if you look here on the um, on the right hand side, the left one is basically the year of publication of books uh, for members and for non-members. And what you can see is that clearly there is like you know uh, a bias with non-members being published much later, basically than than members. And that you can imagine that you know obviously books uh, written in English published in um, eighteen fifty uh, will be quite different from books published in you know in the years you know in in um, what is it nineteen fifty for example right the way we write the way we speak what we talk about is obviously likely to be very different so we try to con we identify this as an issue already back then. And so we try to control by year of original publication as a way to try to avoid at least that one obvious uh, obvious bias and obvious distribution shift. Um, but again, I think fundamentally, right, from a, from a scientific perspective, 
you can control by a number of things, um, but ultimately you can never know if you know there isn't something else that actually you model in this case you meta classifier picks up on um, that that you've not thought about. And and further evidence of this is actually recent results on you know document level membership inference attacks on a clean or at least cleaner randomized control setup. Um, so first, there was um, a paper that we proposed in February of this year, so two months ago, in which basically we teamed up with uh, the people behind Croissant LLM, which is the French, uh, English French uh, model, 1.3 billion. Um, and they basically agreed to, um, in, we collected our own small data set and we randomly inserted some of our documents in their pre-training uh, data set while we kept others uh, to ourselves. And so we basically created a randomized control setup in which documents would be randomly either inserted or not inserted uh, in the pre-training data set. And what's really interesting is that you can see that both methods existing at the time, so the membership classifier and MinK, the MinK++ did not exist, both of them failed to infer membership. Again, this is one specific model, one specific set of documents, et cetera, et cetera. But it is some first evidence, at least, that like you know, in a cleaner randomized control setup, it is it is quite a difficult uh, task. Um, and then basically, I think very soon after, like a couple of days, literally after. Another paper came out that leveraged basically a similar ID. They did not create the randomized control setup, uh, but actually leveraged the fact that uh, there is uh, a test set in the pile that they expect models to not have used during training. Um, and basically, they ran the same, uh, you know, their own attack as well as others on Wikipedia and archive with a range of models and basically reach the same conclusions. What used to be quite good at UC uh, turned out to be no method performing before 0 0.6. So again, here we have you know, a much cleaner randomized control setup uh, with method and a range of models that suggest that models do not really memorize and or at least average um, document level membership in front attack uh, do not necessarily work. And they even go further, and they make a really, really good point uh, that even in this clean randomized control setup, uh, there are still you know, potential leakages basically between the test set um, and uh, in members and non-member sequences. And basically, you use seven gram, and you know, I'll refer to the paper for more details, but basically they show that there exists still some significant overlap um, between uh, members and non-members in the test set. Basically suggesting that even if you were to take documents completely randomly uh, out, uh, there is still significant overlaps, both in archive papers, clearly on GitHubs and others, which, which makes this you know, quite a difficult, a difficult task, even uh, when you can randomly uh, take document out of the pre-training data set. Um, the third solution now um, is basically something called copyright traps. It basically, it leverages an, an old idea, uh, which is back in the days when, when, you know, when, when drawing maps, when, when writing dictionaries, basically people were inserting pictures uh, entries and using these fixtures and trees to then prove basically that uh, their content was used to create another map, to create another dictionary. Um, you know, they invented a fake uh, ski slope here in London uh, in Agerston uh, Park that does not exist next to the city farm, or they added like, you know, fixtures and trees like Mount Weasel uh, in, in dictionaries. And a similar ideas they used to use watermark uh, sensitive documents to prevent to prevent leaks. So the idea here was, could a similar idea be used 
to actually detect that a piece of content was used to train, uh, so both pre-train or fine-tuning an LLM. And the idea here would be sequences that are synthetically generated and, and likely to be unique, and to basically randomly inject them into uh, a document or across documents. It's obviously much more difficult, right? Because you don't, you know, it's not, you don't have access to the original um, data set. You only have access to the model. And so basically you need the LLM to, to memorize the trap sequences so that they are detectable uh, when you query the model. And here, basically, we leverage a lot of previous work, uh, including work on privacy and work on extraction attacks against LLM for a very different task, which is copyright uh, detection, detecting that a piece of content was seen during training and was the goal of not extracting the next token, but the goal of detecting that a sequence was seen during uh, training. So basically, the same thing, except that now you know, content would be marked with a trap sequence. And the question is, once the LLM is released with black box access, can we, can we show and we detect whether the trap sequence and does the book was seen by the large language model during training? Um, how do we do this? Uh, in this case, basically, it's use a reference model to generate uh, statistically unique trap sequences. So, you know, you pick a first token and then basically you keep, you keep drawing uh, until you get a token of the desired length. Um, one thing, however, is that our belief is that high perplexity sequences, so basically unusual sequences, are both more likely to be statistically unique therefore to not appear somewhere else, meaning if you've seen that sequence, it can only come from us, and to be more memorized uh, by the model. And then basically what we do is that one sequence will be injected into the training set, while all of the other sequences are going to be kept as controlled sequences. Basically, the only thing, again, in the randomized controlled setup that distinguishes one sequence from all the others is the fact that it was injected. And so again, causally, any difference is due to the trap being injected, the sequence being injected. Um, to do this, basically, again, randomized control setup, you have an equal amount of member and non-member, 50% baseline, uh, using three uh, MIAs from the literature, so loss, the loss in itself, mean k prop, same thing, as well as ratio, which is basically the model loss of the sequence divided by the loss given to us by our reference uh, model here, lama 27 b And so this is what a, what a sequence would look, uh, would look like. And basically what we show is that um, really interestingly, even in a model that you know, arguably is high compression, right? 1.3 billion parameters trained on 3 trillion uh, tokens, uh, we can see that the model does memorize the trap sequences that we've repeated a number of times across uh, across the book, and that basically the more the trap sequence was seen, so basically as measured here was training steps and the different checkpoints that we've saved, as well as the length of the sequence. So the more it is seen, the more it is memorized. The longer the sequence is, the more it is memorized. With longer sequences, like 100 tokens, uh, seen a number of times, um, I think this is a hundred times, um, can be, is memorized, giving us like an AUC of, what is it, like 0.68? It's not perfect, but this is, you know, a clean setup with a random uh, baseline, and us being able to definitely conclude that whatever we see is due to the trap sequences having been injected. Uh, we've also looked at higher perplexity, our hypothesis, basically, that higher perplexity sequences are more likely to be memorized. And again, we can see that there is quite a nice relationship between perplexity and AUC, uh, with basically higher perplexity sentences, you know, more unusual sentences being more likely to be, uh, to be memorized. And intrinsically, uh, interestingly, uh, we've also observed that naturally occurring trap sequences so trap sequences of, say, 50 token repeated 100 times are barely memorized. 
so there is something about injecting synthetic, statistically unique sequences a certain number of times so that they get memorized. And because the sequence that you've injected is no different from any other sequence that you have that you kept on the side, you can attribute any difference between the two purely causally from the sequence having been inserted into the training data set. This approach is not without limitations, obviously. Um, traps are resistant, trap sequences are resistant to document level deduplication. Uh, but increasingly, you know, uh, some sequence level deduplications is being uh, used, although it's quite computationally expensive, and it probably has an impact on utility. Um, and there is also a question of how do you inject those sequences, right? It, it works very nicely, but those sequences are 100 token and need to be repeated quite a large number of times to be to be very well memorized by at least, you know, a high compression model. So we have ideas like you know hiding them basically uh, in 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 CSS sheets, you know, across the website, across documents. Uh, definitely, you cannot just you know put them in the text. They're going to be visible. They're going to you know hurt readability. Uh, but we believe there might be a number of ways in which you can you can get them to be basically seen by the scraper uh, without hurting uh, utility readability. Um, so maybe to to conclude, so that I leave time for you know live discussion. Um, so transparency of LLM pre training data is, is super important, right? Those models are going to be deployed; they are being deployed pretty much everywhere. Understanding what you know, what data, what document, what text they learn from, is absolutely essential from a you know, from a fairness perspective, from a copyright perspective, from a bias perspective. Um, I think we've seen attempts, at least in Europe, from a legislative perspective, to try to bring some transparency. Uh, the Act, for example, has requirements, transparency requirements on foundation model developers. Um, but it's unlikely, or at least we're not confident yet, that these are going to be sufficient. Uh, and bring enough transparency for us to be able to answer those important questions. Um, then we have three technical solutions, right? None of them are perfect. Uh, data provenance tools, um, you know, super powerful, really amazing. Um, but you know, companies are increasingly building their own scrapers. They're seeing pre-training data as some kind of secret sauce. Um, and you know, as competition increases in the field, we think you know, data provenance tools are likely uh, to be to be sufficient uh, to truly understand um, what a model, what kind of content a model learned from. Then we have a whole class, quite active field of document level membership in France tax. Um, they might work. Uh, in particular, I think in cases, you know, we've all seen the New York Times uh, lawsuit and the regurgitation. Um, in particular, in cases where, where documents appear multiple times or they've been, you know, given more weight during during training, um, but hopefully, I think some of the results that we've seen also show that it, I mean, it can be hard to, you know, basically definitely conclude what the method is is exactly picking up on, um, and then some result from, you know, properly randomized, controlled, or at least, you know, as clean as possible setups. Um, suggest that current attacks might not work as well as we think. Uh, and this is very much, this is not a conclusion. This is not the end of the story. Um, this is this is something really new that is happening at the moment. But my feeling is kind of this is this is where we are, and these are some of the uh, challenges for this. Uh, and then the third one, basically, we have uh, you know synthetically generated copyright traps uh, that do allow you to do document level membership uh, in front attacks, even in models that do not memorize. Um, the issue is uh, basically they only work for future content, right? Content that has already been scraped; it's too late. Um, and also, they need to be repeated a, a fairly large number of times. 
And there is an open question of whether they can be removed automatically by scrapers, removed by deduplication, or even adversary removed uh, by companies trying to collect uh, content in a covered uh, manner. So not a perfect solution either, but you know, might help bring some uh, transparency. So basically, I try to keep it fairly short. I know it's it's not ideal to do this uh, to do this remotely. Um, you know, this is this is a fast moving field. This is basically my feeling of of where we are at the moment and kind of what what exists, as well as some of the uh, some of the challenges. Um, and with that, I will uh, happily answer uh, any questions.